This week, gone in six seconds with a simple high-tech car jack. Scrums and gums. And it's the end of the world as we know it, but we feel fine. For many of us, our car is one of the most valuable things that we own. It's sometimes crazy to think that we just leave them out on the streets. But of course, that is because they are built with good security. But in the last few years, we have started to see this happening. Newer cars with keyless entry have been fooled by thieves with relay boxes. They stand outside your house and the box magnifies the signal from your key fob, which may be sitting inside. So the car thinks the key fob is closer than it really is. And hey presto, they're off with your car. So many car owners have turned to third party car alarms which promise to protect against this kind of attack. These are fitted to order and many offer the ability to remotely control your car using a smartphone app, which is handy, unless these can be hacked too. You probably don't want to see what's coming next, but we're going to show you anyway. It's something we'd hope wasn't possible in real life but worryingly, it is. The Black Range Rover has been chosen and then tracked and is now the target for two hackers who are waiting to make their move. The victim has no idea of what's about to happen, as first the car alarm goes off and then the attackers take control of the door locks. Get out of the car. Give me your key. Give me your keys, okay? A new way to steal luxury cars to order? Well, we've actually set this up to show you how security researchers have discovered what is now possible. The victim can't restart the car, only the attackers can do that. It's one of several ways in which car alarms sold by two of the world's biggest brands in car security can now be used against their owners. So how can this happen? We've been given exclusive access to the labs where the research happened and the security companies who failed their customers have been given seven days to put things right. More on that later, but first, Let's take a closer look at what went so badly wrong. The test compromised a VW and a Range Rover, but the failings have nothing to do with the car manufacturer, but rather these makes of alarms that millions of car owners have fitted to protect their wheels. Clifford in the UK, also sold as Viper in the US, is one of the market leaders and claims to prevent carjacking, while Pandora, based in Russia and sold in the UK, also fell short of its own audacious claims. Currently, I wouldn't recommend the Viper or the Pandora alarms, and the Pandora alarms was claimed to be unhackable, but right now, I wouldn't recommend these alarms. Pandora has recently dropped that claim from its website, just as well. So the first primary reason that most people are, are fit a third party aftermarket car alarm like the, Van, the, the Viper or the Pandora is to prevent the key relay attacks that we've seen videos of where two guys appear at your house, wave a magic box by your wall and then are able to drive the car away. So that's the first reason and, and the sort of additional security that comes with that. The second reason that people buy these is the remote start functionality and the remote start functionality could allow you to preheat the car before you get into it on a cold winter's day, have the ice gone off the windscreen, but also to cool the car down on a hot summer's day as well. Trouble is, some of these nice to have comfort features have been shown by the researchers to be the very reason why they were able to take so much control. 
The functionality we found a problem with is in the back-end systems. Rather than asking for the information about my specific car, I could ask for any car. Any car that this system is registered with, or this, that they're registered with, we can query that information. And that includes the person's name, full name, the location, and, and find it real-time on a map. We can get the model of the car. Um, we can do the start-stop remotely. We can turn the panic alarm on remotely. So I could look on the system and look for a nice Lamborghini or a Porsche, for example, and think, oh, I wonder where that is. Is it in the UK where I'm located? Oh yeah, it's just down the road from me. Great, I'm gonna go and start that car if no one's around and unlock the doors and drive away. So who are these people with such superpowers? Well, this is Pentest Partners, and it's one of a growing number of firms in the UK that are paid to break into security systems by the companies that run them. Pentest has contracts with several car manufacturers, among other clients, who want them to find vulnerabilities. But when these guys have some spare time, well, they start testing other systems too. Vangelis usually works from Greece, but he's come over to show me how he broke in to the Pandora alarm. Pandora provides you with a demo account and uh, we found a flow that we could enumerate all the users and then we could change that user's uh, email, issue a password reset and uh, we would get the new password on our changed email, which so we you, control. You basically just reset a user's password and you've got control? Yes, after changing his own email to my controlled email. And the system lets you do that? Yeah, apparently. That's what we call an insecure direct observe reference. Uh, can you show us how? Yeah. Uh, I have written a script to automate uh, everything. Mm -hmm. I'm just using my own user ID and this uh, user ID could be anyone that is using Pandora. Right, so you're using your own ID yes. mainly to stay within the law just to yes. show what's possible. Okay. Yes. So now I'm waiting for the password email that it will have the new password with my changed email. And you could do this for any user out there at yes. Pandora. You change their password, you gain their account, and then you're into the system. Yes. So the system now is just waiting for the response from Pandora. Yes. That automatic email that you get when you want to reset your password. Yes. You have to wait a few seconds, and here, here it comes. Yes. So you now have a new password. That I can log in to the system and control uh, my, because I have provided my user ID, but any user's vehicle. Now, it's worth emphasising that these are just normal manual cars. They're not autonomous. They just happen to have the extra security devices fitted. Now, we think it affects around 3 million cars on the road globally. And as far as we know, criminals haven't used the vulnerability yet to steal a vehicle. But the fact it's even possible will no doubt be cause for some red faces among the big brand names in the industry. In a statement, Pandora said our customer's security is paramount. They made changes to the code and eliminated an unauthorised point of access for the online app. And they noted that the key fob provided to owners would override any remote access through the app. Directed, the parent company of Clifford and Viper Alarms, said that their customer accounts could have been accessed without authorization. This was a result of a recent system update. Directed believes that no customer data or accounts were accessed without authorization and says it's committed to providing safe and secure products, but adds that no system can be 100% safe. For these professional security testers, though, the failings they found ought to be a wake-up call for the people paid to protect us. So, so we were shocked. We see all sorts of vulnerabilities like this, but this one's right up there. It's a security product that's supposed to make our cars safer and more secure, but yet it's actually made us potentially more exposed and less secure. I'm concerned about the way this scales up. There are millions of cars exposed something like 200 billion pounds worth of vehicles have these alarm fitted. It was the manufacturers that made the mistake. 
they had the security flaw. But there is still something that you can do as a consumer. Please make sure that you don't use the same password for your mobile apps as you use on other systems. Why? Because hackers will be trying passwords, they'll try and steal them from other places. And if that's the same password as your car alarm, you might wake up the next morning and find your car's gone. That was Ken Munro finishing Dan's piece. Dan, I can't get over the fact that these are companies that work in the security industry and they put security holes in their own products. I know, I know. I mean, it, it is difficult to... Face palm it moment? is a face palm yeah. moment. <laughs> it is a face palm moment. And, um, you know, they're playing it very cool with their reactions to us, saying, you know, nothing to see here. We fixed the problem. Uh, thanks very much for letting us know. Um, mm. But really, uh, we're paying hundreds of pounds to these companies to keep yeah. us safe, and they've left the back door wide open. This is one of the reasons why the security researchers that did this piece of work gave those companies just seven days to get their act in gear. Normally it's about 30 days for disclosure. Yeah. Give them a bit more time, work out what the problem this was. Needs sorting. It needs sorting straight away. Yeah. And in fairness, they did a reasonably good job. Okay, so I'm sure there might be some people watching who say, should we even be broadcasting this technique and details about this technique? Because surely it'll tell people how to crack into cars. Right, and obviously we wouldn't if that vulnerability was still out there. It's been solved, it's been fixed by these two companies. Pandora did it in four days, Viper took five days before they reported back to us and we've checked their results and we now know that those security holes are fixed. And that's why we could go into some detail with viewers exactly how the researchers managed to break into the system. So this is a story just about car alarms. We're not talking about vulnerabilities in the actual driving of the car itself, mm -hmm. but cars are becoming more automated, aren't they? They're yeah. starting to control various parts of the journey. Any evidence that there's any vulnerabilities in that technology at the moment? Well, when you hear a story like this, you get nervous yeah. as things get more and more automated. And the trouble is that it's a security company that's dropped the ball here. Now, if that were to happen with a car in control of the steering wheel or the speed at which it's traveling while we're inside, you could imagine that the consequences would be much, much worse than the possibility of thieves pinching your car. Yeah, okay. Dan, thank you very much. Brilliant report. Uh, drive safe, I guess. Thanks. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that a Huawei announced it's suing the US government after they banned federal agencies from using the Chinese firm's products over national security concerns. The manufacturer says no evidence has been provided to back up the suggestions and denies any connection to the Chinese government. Autonomous vehicle trials continue. Volvo's 12-metre bus was unveiled this week in Singapore and is ready to be tested on designated public roads. Eventually, it's expected to help reduce traffic, pollution and, I guess, work for bus drivers. A robotic hand with haptic feedback has been developed. Replicating the master robot's moves remotely, the Shadow Robot Company's mission is to relay touch to its wearer, wherever they may be. And finally, meet this little running, jumping, backflipping bot. Well, it's more about the fact that MIT's Mini Cheetah is so springy and nifty on its feet that it can move in all directions twice as fast as a human's average walking pace. Weighing in at just 20 pounds, it's pitched as almost indestructible. Impressive, but I'd still rather have a head. Now, as the Six Nations enters its fourth round and the Rugby World Cup looms, the safety of the sport is in the headlines once again. Laura Lewington has been looking at a piece of equipment which could offer key information to make the game safer. Fast-paced, heavy-hitting, you wouldn't want to be in the way of one of these guys. And that's just the training. But impacts like this can really take their toll on both the tackled and the tackler. 
concussion, an injury to the brain caused by a head impact, is a serious issue in contact sport. It can lead to early retirement or it can even prove fatal. Concussion is trauma to the brain, either directly through a blow to the head or transmitted from a blow from another part of the body. The symptoms of concussion are wide and variable. It can be from headaches, change in vision, blurred vision, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise. You can feel nauseous, you can get neck pain. It's important that you identify that so that you get the diagnosis correct and you get the proper treatment. The Ospreys, a professional team in South Wales, are one of the first to use technology to gather data aiming to deal with this kind of injury in the future. <laughs> Protect is a gum shield fitted with sensors to monitor impacts to the head. We've made these bespoke mouth guards, so each of these mouth guards is really tightly coupled to the player's teeth, so their, a dentist comes in and takes the impressions that when they have a head impact, the mouth guard's actually moving with the skull, so you're getting a really good, accurate skull acceleration. As far as us as players go in, it's just another mouth guard, and uh, you don't really feel it uh, in your mouth, obviously the chips and things, it's, like I say, it's just another mouth guard, and uh, we don't realise. Fitted with accelerometers and gyroscopes, the device measures the force that the skull is subjected to during training and games. So one of the biggest problems with rugby union is the second impact syndrome. So that, that's the one that can be fatal. All these would help to um, reduce is the incidence of second impact syndrome. So a medic on the sideline can have a look at that and go, oh, OK, maybe it's time we walk them off. It gives them an extra objective source of information to base their decisions on. The results can be fed in real time to medics on the sidelines to decide on the best course of action if there's an incident. Whilst it can't detect whether this has resulted in a concussion, the medics can keep an eye on the data to judge players who may be at risk. And in the long term, this information also provides an opportunity to learn the correlation between an impact and its effect. We can go into the individual player's impacts and start to look at the shape of the impacts themselves, both in terms of linear and rotational acceleration. So that becomes quite important because of the cumulative impact of concussion. So we are really trying to understand here that what might have happened in the past that will influence the future. If you think about today, the way players are observed for head injuries is, is typically what happens is that it's very visual. What we're adding is a layer of data. So it, it very much is an additive thing that starts with visual, adds data, and that gives you a much more confident answer to both parts. But does wearing this kind of device provide any reassurance for the players? Yeah, I don't know about that. If you've got a big guy coming down your channel, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be the same whether you have it in or, or you don't. But like I say, if you get a big collision, you know, you can, you can look back and understand you know, how big it was and, uh, you know, like I say, that the experts can feed back the data and, and that you can get a better understanding about it. So whilst it may not prevent the incident or the damage, it could mean a chance for the speediest intervention possible. Old, unwanted cassette tapes lying around? Here's one way to put the cases to good use. Remove the tape. Flip the holder out. And you have an easy stand for your phone. Portrait. Or landscape. Now, next up, post-apocalypse now. Or to put it another way, why are video games so obsessed with the end of the world? I mean, if it's not a pandemic, it's a nuclear war or a zombie outbreak. I mean, come There's a new game called Days Gone, which is the latest title to use the collapse of society as its setting. And Mark Chislak popped down to World's End to find out more. 
A pandemic plunges the world into chaos, infecting the population with a virus and causing society to descend into the kind of madness usually reserved for shops selling low-spec massive tellies on Black Friday. Here, catch! All of this sounds a bit familiar, though. The video games industry likes a sure thing. At the moment, franchises and sequels are really, really big, as are free-to-play battle royale shooters. So, Days Gone, a new PlayStation exclusive, has got its work cut out for it. Number one, it's an original game. It's not part of a series. It's not a follow-up to anything. And number two, it's post-apocalyptic. And there's one or two of those around at the moment. In fact, post-apocalyptic games are more fashionable than skinny jeans. I think the thing is with games similar to films, we get horror that reflects the real world, we get horror films that do that, you know, Dawn of the Dead and Georgie Romero was commenting on consumerism with his shopping malls. Now I don't think it's an accident that we're now looking at the end of the world through nuclear apocalypses or cures for cancer or all of these things. I think gamers like the apocalypse simply for the fact that you can look at it in terms of real life and wonder what you would do. What do they got here? There's a lot of post-apocalyptic games around, I'm thinking Far Cry New Dawn. Metro Exodus. And a little bit further down the line, we've got The Last of Us Part 2 coming out. So how does Days Gone separate itself from the post-apocalyptic pack? Our world is set in the high desert of the Pacific Northwest, which is different than almost any environment I've seen in any kind of a game, let alone open world games, because it's a very harsh environment that is very condensed. You know, just our setting makes us different, but also the fact that you've got one bike, something you have to take care of because you have to fuel it you have to repair it and you have to make sure that um, it's always in good condition. Otherwise, you're going to be on foot in this world and you're going to die. The hell? Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. You'd be forgiven for confusing Days Gone from developers Bend Studios with another post-apocalyptic PlayStation exclusive, The Last of Us 2 from Naughty Dog. Both are set in worlds ravaged by disease and filled with infected monsters. <sighs> yeah, okay, it's a radio. <laughs> and both feature story-driven set pieces. But in Days Gone, the action takes place in a giant open world. And it's an open world full of infected cannibalistic creatures called Freakers. Coming. The player steps into the biker boots of bounty hunter Deacon St. John. What's wrong? Freaky. Deacon is a man with a past, haunted by his separation and presumed death of his wife when the world went a bit 28 days later. I'm always going to love you. And I ain't never going to leave you. The ace this game has up its sleeve is its main antagonist, the Freakers. Freakers are living beings. So it sounds like one of these things where we're like just playing with semantics, like, oh, they're, they're all zombies, right? No, they're not. Damn it, get back here with that. That's mine! Alone or in small numbers, they don't pose too much of a threat. But these guys like to hang around in gangs. Big gangs called hordes. Uh, they have a uh, migration pattern, so hordes will actually sleep during the day. They hibernate in caves, tunnels, train cars. It's, it's literally a whole set of network and, and interacting, you know, living ecosystems that are all doing their thing, whether you're there to watch it or not. Sometimes art holds up a mirror to what's going on around us, presenting us with an exaggerated version of our world, highlighting problems that might exist in our own society. And then again, sometimes people simply enjoy taking out loads of monsters in a virtual Armageddon. Always asking the big questions. That's Mark finishing off this week's programme. Don't forget, we live on social media, so wherever you go, We'll be there waiting for you. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.